out in person myself. Thank you. And now we have our second speaker this morning. Professor Robert Wozniak is a priest of the Archdiocese of Krakow and professor at the Pontifical University of John Paul II in Krakow, where he holds the Chair of Theological Anthropology. He received his doctorate in dogmatic theology from the University of Navarra in Pamplona, and then did his academic training at Fordham University in New York and at the Gregorian University in Rome. He has written extensively on Trinitarian theology, the relationship between theology and philosophy, and the theological threads of postmodernism. Professor Wozniak, we really are looking forward to hearing your thoughts on the subject toward an, ap an academic universalism, rethinking science and the university. Please give a warm welcome to Professor Wozniak. You can live it. It doesn't make any. Sorry, to distract from you. Okay. Thank you very much for invitation. From the very beginning of this event, I have uh, a strong impression that I participate in something very important. We are talking about God. We are talking about theology, not only about the sociological vision of theology, whatever. And uh, for me, as a priest, as uh, as a theologian, as a Christian, it is so very hope-inspiring. I am from Poland, so you probably think that. Poland is a very Catholic, uh, Catholic country, but I think that we now go through very similar process here in Ireland. You had to face um, a few years ago. So teaching at the Catholic University, at the Pontifical University, we have to try to save space for theology as well uh, in Poland, in Poland as well. So thank you very much for this beautiful conference and for the invitation. Uh, when I was listening to Michael, I had the impression that God is great because, uh, I mean, there is a huge connection between saints and the tradition of thinking and spirituality in the church. What you said about Saint Ignatius is so similar to the very beginning of the Franciscan tradition when Saint Anthony asked, St. Francis, is it possible to be a Franciscan and to study and teach theology? Yes, son, you can do it, but please do not extinguish the fire of piety. <clears throat> so the same, um, uh, the same kind of unification of life, spiritual and intellectual. And what Professor uh, Fagioli said at the end of his lecture inspired me to share with you a kind of uh, uh, personal memory. Seven years ago, I was, I mean, the last, the last sentence was that the field hospital needs a doctor, a doctors, this is certain. Seven years ago, I had the privilege to be a personal interpreter of Pope Francis during Youth Day in Krakow. So we spent four days from the morning to the evening. And what shocked me at the time when I was hesitating about his policy according to academy and theology was when I discovered what were uh, requirements he personally put on the person of his uh, interpreter. The person has to know the Buenos Aires dialect. I didn't match it. I didn't match it. So the second requirement he has to have a doctorate in theology. So I asked myself, why? Maybe he wants to be corrected during his, you know, abraccio speaking. And it happened, I have to tell you, twice. So I corrected the magisterium in my life for two, <laughs> two times already. <laughs> now, it was a very beautiful time. And I think that Pope Francis understands, understands uh, academy, theology, intellectual life in the Catholic Church. I have to tell you that we were spending hours together talking about Deli Bach, Balthazar. I mean, he told me that he uh, attempted to read Runner for three or four times, but he couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> 
so but uh, he uh, he he memorized the passages from von Balthasar and Deli Bach, so he can quote. I mean, and knowing from which volume of uh, third drama it comes, whatever. So it was very beautiful. I would like to address today uh, the topic of uh, universalism and university. We are talking about. Uh, University, the very name has to do with the universalism. And uh, the question is, uh, we are living in the very globalized society. Is this globalized society concerning university uh, a really universalized society? The question was openly asked by Pope Francis in his uh, Fratelli Tutti, albeit in a different context, yet not indifferent to the topic at hand. Pope notes that a certain kind of globalization claims to make everyone uniform, to level every, everyone out, that globalization destroys the rich gifts and uniqueness of each person and each people. The issue necessarily also touches on the globalization of knowledge and the idea of the university. Our meeting is devoted to the idea of the university, so its subject is universalism as such especially that form of it which concerns knowledge. Let us recall in this context Newman's important statement, university by its very name professes to teach universal knowledge. How is this possible today in our globalized modernity and its postmodern dialectical simulacra which often simulates universalism with globalism and reductionist uniformity? I will attempt to answer the initial question in several stages. First, I will link the idea of the university to Christian universalism. Then I will briefly sketch the history of the late modern crisis of the university and universalism to, to propose on the basis of a program of Trinitarian ontology, we are in the Trinity College, a solution to the deepening impasse in understanding universalism and the university. Finally, in a brief conclusion, I will attempt to present a defense speech for the presence in th of theology in uh, university structures. The first point, Christianity and its two kinds of universalism. I will make uh, a short presentation of my longer argument. Uh, Summarizing my argument of the first part, I propose following arguments. The first one, Christianity is a universal religion. Paul Badieu and his interpretation of Paul. I mean, it doesn't come from the area of Catholic theology, but it uh, acknowledges the universal uh, character of Christianity. The second uh, argument, Christian universalism acquired in its history, two interconnected forms, missionary universalism and what I call methodological universalism, by which I understand a kind of ability, natural attitude of Christianity to enter in the dialogue with different cultures. This dialogue, both assimilation and rejection, has a soteriological uh, character, I mean by it that it does not destroy the culture uh, it receives. Christianity represents a kind of knowledge in continuity, interconnectivity. It is clear because it is the religion based on the idea of incarnation. The incarnation does not reject creation. And the third uh, point is that university, as we can observe it here and uh, today, is the fruit of such Christian universalism. Let's remind here important words of uh, Pope Benedict XVI in Regensburg. It is a moving experience for me to be back again in the university and to be able once again to give a lecture at this podium. I think back to those years when, after a pleasant period at the Freisinger Hochschule, I began teaching at the University of Bonn. That was in 
1959, in the days of the old university made up of ordinary professors. The various chairs and had neither assistants nor secretaries, but in recompense there was much direct contact with students, and in particular among the professors themselves. We would meet before and after lessons in the rooms of the teaching staff. There was a lively exchange with historians, philosophers, philologists, and naturally between the two theological faculties. Once a semester, there was a Dies Academicus, when professors from every faculty appeared before the students of the entire university, making possible a genuine experience of universitas. The experience, in other words, of the fact that despite our specializations, which at times make it difficult to communicate with each other, we made up a whole working in everything on the basis of a single rationality with its various aspects and sharing responsibility for the right use of reason. This reality became a lived experience. The Pope's memoirs are more than a dose of sentimentality and nostalgia for a time gone by. For Pope was a word that since that 50s, much has changed in the understanding and design of universities. It can be said that it was in the second half of the 20th century that the radical modern critique of Christianity and theology led to a powerful revolution in the academic world. The second point, narrowing epistemological universalism in modernity. Let us remind Newman again. The university teaches universal knowledge. It seems that such situation changed in modernity. This modern process of narrowing universality is particularly evident in the perspective of the dynamics of the current phase of postmodernity. While the medieval university was characterized by the incorporation of multiple research perspectives and multiple methodologies, Late modernity brought with it a narrowing of the concept of knowledge, ideologically enabled by a whole series of causes dominating and controlling the dynamics of modernity's development. Generalizing. One can say that the mainstream modern mentality undermined the validity of any cognition outside the empirical formal scheme. This model of understanding rationality introduced a dramatic division between knowledge and belief and led to the development of a reductive understanding of scientific activity and thus of rationality itself. The, insu the insular tradition was constantly tempted by empiricism and Kant, not without its influence, contributed to sidelining metaphysics and theology, placing synthetic a priori knowledge, pure natural science, and above all, pure mathematics at the center of true and certain knowledge. The culmination of this approach came, at least in theory, during the period of the Vienna Circle and its radical demarcation postulates, which declared all sentences impossible to verify empirically to be nonsensical. Although this most violent form of logical positivism was met with a strong critical response and in its wake quickly receded into the background, its echoes can still be heard, especially in the rather frequent denial of scientific status to the humanities theology and philosophy. On the ideological background of this modern tendency stands post-medieval nominalism. Olivier Brunois showed that the Scottish theory of the university of the concept of being, universitas entis, led to a revolution in the understanding of metaphysics from the science of being to the science of the concept of being. While Amos Funkenstein, with a twist, proved that it had a not significant influence on the emergence of the detail-oriented ideal of modern science. Occam's famous razor furthered radicalized the Scottish Revolution by rejecting overly specialized complex speculations, abstract syllogism. 
Occam rejected Scotus's theory of generality of forms, standing on the ground of radical empiricism, holding that there is nothing general in the world of individual entities, since every real thing existing outside the mind is by that very fact particular. The turn to modeling knowledge on the basis of empiricism and mathematical formal thinking, understood in one way or another, led not only to the increasing specialization of knowledge, but also to the exclusion of classically recognized fields of cognition from its space. This can be seen in the English language usus, which restricts the name of science to sciences, that use the empirical and formal methodology. Humanities, philosophy, and theology are not considered as sciences in this linguistic usage. The essence of the problem described here is to reduce and narrow the concept of science to one type of thinking and research or rationality. A universality built on such a usus, even if it does not yet give up these fields, may treat them as second-class realities. We remember that Kant already divided faculties uh, into higher and lower ones. And although his classification, theology, law, medicine, as higher faculties, and philosophy as lower faculties, is no longer accepted today, in a certain way, the original division into higher and lower sciences remains valid, although the classification itself, at least in the case of theology, has been reversed. Let us note that nomina nominalistically supported university breaks down into many unconnected disciplines and becomes a corporation offering space for autonomous individuals and fields of knowledge in their specialization. Besi besides which is no less a problem, it is characterized by a certain dialectical tension, a competition between separated fields of knowledge, disciplines, the object of which is the struggle for primacy on the criteria of scientificity. The nominalist university is divided and fractured and further marked by methodological disputes of competence to a large extent. It does not present universal knowledge, but fragmented and antagonized knowledge. Paradoxically, it is precisely theology that can serve as its cure. Now I turn to my third point, Trinitarian Ontology Project. Few words on what is this Trinitarian Ontology. The fact that the university is a product of Christian universalism refers directly to the very center of Christian faith, which is the Trinitarian mystery. Today, Trinitarian theology is experiencing a particular revival. Although secularized culture is displacing doctrinal issues, fragments of Trinitarian discourse are increasingly returning not only to theology itself, but also to spirituality and a broader understanding of the world as such. One of the most res recent theological projects is Trinitarian ontology. The idea refers to a famous letter that Klaus Hemmerle wrote to Hans Urs von Balthasar. In it, Hemmerle proposes to think of all reality in a Trinitarian perspective. The inner life of God becomes the key to understanding the whole of existence in its many facets. An important dimension of Trinitarian ontology is the centrality of the concept of relation. As early as the fourth century, Athanasius and the Cappadocian fathers invoked it, and Aquinas, in the very heart of the medieval period, defined a person in God through it, a subsistent relation. Ratzinger rightly argues in his introduction to Christianity that the relational metaphysics of the fathers brought about a radical revolution in the history of thinking about being. By placing the notion of relation at the very center of metaphysics, Christian theology became cap capable of transcending ancient substantialism and essentially static and closed conception of being. I quote from Ratzinger, the sole dominion of thinking in terms of substance 
is ended. Relation is discovered as an equally valid primordial mode of reality. It becomes possible to surmount what we call today objectifying thought. A new plane of being comes into view. It is probably true to say that the task imposed on philosophy as a result of these facts is far from being completed. So much does modern thought depend on the possibilities thus disclosed without which it would be inconceivable. The, four, the fourth point, the last one. The university in the perspective of Trinitarian relational ontology. In light of what has been said above, two major possibilities emerge for applying relational ontology to the idea of the university. These are the rejection of the pyramidal conception of scientific knowledge and university and the expansion of the limits of rationality. Applying a Trinitarian ontology to the reality of the university allows us to put it in a relational perspective. This is a novelty in the horizon of the modern dispute of the faculties, Streit which not only disciplined and shredded knowledge, but also dialectically antagonized the newly emerging disciplines and their methodologies. The ontology of relation allows us to relate the various fields of knowledge to one another without confusion or separation, but also without subordination. Taken theologically, Relation does not presuppose an antagonistic separatism or an indifferent fusion of everything into one dimensional cognition, nor does it imply the subordination of the members of relation and the, result, uh, and the resulting, uh, resulting factor of violence and struggle. Kant's Streit, Hegel's Aufhebung. I would say that this Aufhebung is a negatively dialectical at the end. At this point, it is necessary to be critical of that part of John Milbank's project, which involves a new re-subordination of the sciences to theology. In his program to transcend modern dualism and its avatar in the form of secularism, Milbank proposes to subordinate all human knowledge to theology. The postulate of defending theology in the space of human knowledge is most legitimate, but this form of it, which presupposes this subordination of all the disciplines to theology, seems untenable, if only from a methodological perspective, but not only. If a Trinitarian ontology is to be the model for our thinking, then every effort must be made to avoid the shows of thinking about the relationship of the individual sciences in terms of subordination. I am saying this, uh, I mean it. <laughs> I really mean it. A more, um, a more appropriate way of articulating the aforementioned relationship is the model proposed by Spanish physicist and philosopher of science, Javier Sanchez Canizares. I quote, I do not consider physics, claims Canizares, to be more important than other scientific disciplines. The hierarchical and pyramidal model of the sciences is being demolished and replaced by a network model, where each node is defined by its relations with the others in a somewhat diffuse but not less real way. Diffuse but not less real way. Perplexity at the beginning and the perplexity at the end. Pache Fontier. <laughs> It should be emphasized that knowledge understood as a network presupposes that particular parts of the network are defined by others. This differentiation is the key to the unity of all knowledge. Viewing the university not as a space of independent units and disciplines, permanently arguing with each other also about the model of rationality and primacy in the world of science, but remaining in mutual relations, creates convenient conditions for overcoming the reefs 
of thinking that reduces scientificness only to a particular set of sciences. Their relational perspective allows for extending the boundaries of rationality. It is about a fixed habit of thinking in which one does not make arbitrary decisions about the scientific and rational statute of discourse on the basis of a narrow, simplistic understanding of knowledge. The point is not to abandon the idea of certain knowledge and attempts to define its minimum conditions, but to take a broader view in which the idea of true knowledge itself is determined not so much by monolithic thinking in terms of a merely valid theory of knowledge, but by theories of, of cognition and scientific research based on a pluralistic methodology resulting from the relations of multiple approaches. Such a methodology is no way presupposes is no way presupposes the mixing of different methodologies, but the harmonious coexistence, the folding of multiple methodologies into a single trajectory of stratified knowledge. At this, all this retains its weight also in relation to theology and its place in the university. Let us listen again to Newman. As to the range of university teaching, certainly the very name of university is inconsistent with restrictions of any kind. As to the range of university teaching, certainly the very name of university is inconsistent with restrictions of any kind. Newman's opinion expressed in the horizon of the defense of the place of theology in the university clearly indicates the basic error of the worldview of all those who, are, who try to manipulate the idea of university today, if only by excluding from it some fields of knowledge, especially those that once constituted its foundation and determined its basic structure. Critique of modern reason from within has nothing to do with putting the clock back to the time before the Enlightenment, says Pope Benedict, and rejecting the insights of the modern age. The positive aspects of modernity are to be acknowledged unreservedly. We are all grateful for the marvelous possibilities that it has opened up for mankind and for the progress of humanity that has been granted to us. The scientific ethos, moreover, the will to be obedient to the truth and as such, it embodies an attitude which belongs to the essential decisions of the Christian spirit. The intention here is not one of retrenchment or negative criticism, but of broadening our concept of reason and its application. We will succeed in doing so only if reason and faith come together in a new way if we overcome the self-imposed limitation of reason to the empirically falsifiable, and if we once more disclose its vast horizons. In this sense, theology rightly belongs in the university and within the wide-ranging dialogue of sciences, not merely as a historical discipline and one of the human sciences, but precisely as theology, as inquiry into the rationality of faith. I find... Very similar program, not only in Benedict Ratzinger, but as well in Jean-Luc Marion and in his phenomenology or in his phenomenological ontology. I think that it, it has something in common as well with uh, what uh, Pope Francis says about this uh, relational rationality of polyhedron. So a kind of change of the concept of knowledge and the relationships between sciences. In my text, I have tried to show what conception of knowledge flows directly from theology itself. It is networked, relational, non-hierarchical knowledge. It turned out that theology can today contribute to the renewal of the idea of the university, both through its ontology of relations and its heuristic ability to expand the limits of rationality significantly narrowed in modernity, especially in its late form. This actual possibility provides the best argument for its presence in the structures of the university 
and at the same time points to its inherent rational character. The university needs not only empirical knowledge expressed in formalizations, but also a broad reflection of humanities, philosophy, and theology. Besides, it is the humanities, and especially philosophy and theology, that can preserve it from endless disputes about which discipline is more scientific and therefore more university-like. These disputes transcend the ordinary and legitimate search for true and certain knowledge and arise from conflicts that ultimately tarnish knowledge and destroy universities' universalism. In the end, theology, with its Trinitarian-based idea of relation, may prove to be the key to developing a substantially dialogical rather than dialectical ideal of hospitable rationality, hospitable rationality, that by separating superstition from reliable and true knowledge, is able to understand rationality broadly enough, according to its deepest nature. Understood in this way, theology becomes the servant of the university, and significantly, it loses nothing in this. Indeed, it gains. Without subordinating the whole spectrum of knowledge to itself, its proper place, becoming an instrument of reconciliation and universalization. Thank you very much.